welcome to the Litigation and E-Discovery Confex. My name is Kat Casey. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer for DISCO, and I am thrilled to be here with Jay Carl. He is the Deputy Chair of E-Discovery and Information Governance for CIFARC, and we are very excited to talk to you about innovation in the law today. Jay, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, very pleased to be here, Kat. So uh, I want to thank DISCO for inviting me to speak at this event. Um, we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Awesome. So let's start with the kind of big 10,000 foot view. How, how has the practice of law and, and your practice in particular changed over the last couple of years? What's new? What's different? Sure. I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a lot to talk about there, but um, you know, in some ways it's changed uh, considerably and in some ways it hasn't changed very much at all. I mean, we have, um, you know, since I've been working in uh, e-discovery and working as an e-discovery attorney, you know, there have been constant challenges with respect to very large data sets and, you know, um, you know trying to wrestle issues with data collection, um, you know, making sure that data is being preserved properly, et cetera. You know, a lot of those problems have been solved in some respects, but in other ways, you know, technology just keeps moving forward and keeps moving forward. And it's a lot of the same issues kind of over and over again, but just in slightly different formats. And then the industry is all of a sudden challenged with, well, how are we going to collect and how do we manage this kind of data? Like you take um, a lot of the collaboration platforms these days, uh, um, you know, particularly with COVID and a lot of people working remote have, uh, you know, seen a tremendous amount of um, use Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're looking at new kinds of data sets and how to collect them seamlessly. And, and when they're built out, uh, they're not necessarily built uh, with electronic discovery in mind, right? So mm -hmm. we've got to face those challenges. Um, but, you know, in some ways, yesterday's problems have been solved with respect to uh, electronic discovery. Um, you know, and uh, as innovators, we're, I think that the, the general practice uh, in itself is, is finding new ways to kind of Push e discovery forward, right? And so, you know, there's some really exciting things on the horizon, like um, portable predictive models. Um, uh, which, let me just take a step back. You know, the 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 use of continuous active learning and uh, has really kind of taken off. And from my perspective, at least um, with the cases that I manage, you know, we are full uh, adopters of the technology, and we like to push it forward and, and utilize it as much as we can. And next on the horizon, I see the, the, the use of portable predictive models as a, a, a big thing. I think that'll really move the ball forward. That's super exciting. And so I guess for model sharing, if we take the Netflix analogy, it would be like starting out with kind of a pre-populated queue that already had some ideas of the type of documentaries you liked because you would you know, input that information at a prior time. Um, are you seeing folks know how to use model sharing and how, how do you embrace it kind of in your practice? Because it's a, it's a pretty exciting way to not be starting at zero on every single case. No, it's, uh, you're right. It's very exciting, Kat. Um, you know, I, from my perspective, it feels like that, that use of the technology is uh, in its infancy and everyone's trying to kind of figure it out exactly how it is working. And I think some organizations are probably using the portable models right now um, and then fine tuning it. But I think it's very exciting and it's a, it's a step forward in use of the technology, particularly where you have very similar cases that you are gonna be handling you know, for a particular client, just say like labor and employment type cases, discrimination cases, but it could be commercial disputes as well, um, where you've got the same similar kinds of claims over and over again. You can take a, uh, what is essentially a numeric model of predictive algorithms that were built up in a separate case and for the same client, take that and port it over to a new case to gain insights on that case. And it might bubble up some, some key information for an initial risk assessment mm -hmm. or for investigatory purposes. Um, and that's just on the merits, right? So you could use the same kind of predictive algorithm to identify um, you know, documents that you don't necessarily wanna see, right? The irrelevant material or um, you could also uh, build an algorithm and a, and a predictive model for privileged uh, documents, you know, particularly when it's the same um, client's documents, right? Um, you know, there are also theoretically, you could uh, potentially build out models that could be applied, you know, across, um, across different corporations' data sets 
um, just to test out or to get a jump start on that um, on building the model. So a lot of possibilities uh, in terms of speed to evidence um, mm -hmm. or investigatory uh, situations or really trying to understand what the risk is uh, for a particular case. Now, this sounds fascinating and kind of next level. Is it hard to do or, or is it kind of been baked in in such a way that kind of you don't realize you're, you're playing with such powerful AI? Yeah. Um, I think it really depends on the platform, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of platforms and I, and I believe Disco has kind of baked it into the platform, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Disco is one of the platforms in which, um, you know, the algorithm's kind of running in the background, whether or not you're using it or not. And uh, many other platforms uh, kind of have that built in as well. And, um, but it is something that uh, seems to be popping up across the industry in terms of different um, service providers and different platforms that are out there. Um, you know, depending on the implementation, it's, I haven't had the opportunity to get my hands really dirty with it. So it's hard for me to answer the question as to whether or not it's hard to use. But I don't think that it is uh, really going to be that hard to use. Um, it'll be interesting to see how effective it is actually in practice. Um, and that may vary, uh, you know, depending on certain client data sets or certain kinds of cases, um, you know, how effective that is. But I think it really has the potential to be very effective. So it seems like SciFarp has really enabled you to kind of think outside the box and embrace innovative approaches to technology. How, how is your firm's approach to innovation different and how has that impacted your practice? Sure. Um, well, SciFarth has always been a great platform for innovation, right? Um, it's one of the things that we focus on and we focused on it for a long time. And, um, you know, for every, um, for every idea that sticks, you know, there's always several that don't, but we're given a lot of freedom to try things out. Um, but, um, you know, one of the, the, the portable predictive models that we spoke about, that's something that I really want to bring um, to SciFarth and that we're looking at very closely. And, and um, you know, I think that'll be an exciting application of the technology. And then, you know, secondly, the other thing that uh, I think that the e-discovery the e industry as a whole is kind of headed is that, um, you know, is focusing on really getting the value out of that initial process, mm -hmm. right? It is, it is less these days about you know, doing discovery for discovery's sake, or, oh my God, we have to get through these 500,000 documents, you know, how fast can we do it and how cheap can it be done, essentially? Um, you know, discovery for discovery's sake and how many of those documents are actually utilized in downstream litigation. It's always been very, very few. And quite frequently, the documents that are most important to a case are the ones that have been like self-identified, mm -hmm. you know, by a client or uh, identified by speaking directly to a witness or something like that. Um, but I think that that focus is slightly changing now and that te the technology is really getting to a point where it is enabling us as attorneys to find the key information very, very quickly. And not only that, but built-in workflows and features um, within the technology that we're seeing coming out that allow us to leverage the work that takes place during the review phase or the e-discovery attorney's work in using the technology to really kind of hone in by you know, filtering this or tweaking that or looking at this uh, cluster or kind of you know, tweaking the search terms and really kind of digging in, being able to leverage a lot of that information and, and everything that's coming out of the document review downstream. Mm -hmm. So making sure that uh, it's appropriate uh, documents, key information are appropriate we tagged for mm -hmm. deposition outlines and being able to have it there just in time, like right where you need it. You didn't even know it, um, but you see that documents have been kind of set up um, as you go in and you build your deposition outline um, or linking them to transcripts, right? If you're reviewing a deposition transcript and being able to have that information there, um, you know, as well as uh, preparing, um, you know, marrying facts mm -hmm. to the law to be able to make your argument more per persuasively at a discovery hearing or uh, at the substantive pleading stage for like summary judgment, for instance. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, the technology is getting to the point where, you know, we can actually make that a reality. It's pretty exciting. And it, I think it leads into what we kind of started this conversation with is a lot of those, you know, big initial problems that drove innovation in e-discovery in 05, 06, 07, those problems have been solved, but we're thinking bigger picture, bigger application of tech, 
um, and even sometimes application of legacy tech to solve different types of problems. Uh, I know when we were planning for this call, you kind of mentioned that there's some really novel ways that you're using your expertise and technology um, in from the e-discovery lifecycle outside of pure e-discovery. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, one, one of the things that's always been good, uh, big for us in, in our e-discovery practice at SciFARF is, is, um, is making sure that our attorneys have a technology background, right? Or are passionate about technology and just kind of understand it. And so pretty much all of us on, in, on the SciFARF e-discovery and information governance uh, team have some kind of technology background um, that enable us to really understand what's going on under the hood um, for the implementations of technology at our client site, you know, as well as, you know, the e-discovery technology. But outside of the e-discovery practice, you know, we are expanding our practice into uh, cybersecurity, uh, for instance, as well as, you know, it's always been um, part of our practice, but we're able to leverage our skill sets a little bit more in that space. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also data privacy, right? I mean, data privacy has been uh, part of our practice for many, many years uh, as well, um, you know, but we're really seeing a lot of value in the lesson in our skill sets that have developed through e-discovery, the technology backgrounds that we have in applying it to cybersecurity and data privacy. On the, on the cyber side, um, I mean, it's just critically important, absolutely critically important that um, organizations are paying attention, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I might go so far as to say is it's just a question of when it might happen that you're going to have an incident, um, you know, because sooner or later it might just happen. And, and so being prepared for that, um, kind of understanding what to do um, when it happens, whether or not it's a breach or not is, a, is an old, you know, is a question. Um, but oftentimes we find ourselves in a position to provide a really valuable service to our clients by being kind of like an incident commander um, you know, when those events happen, um, because when they happen, you know, they can be very, very scary when you're, when you receive that ransom note, for instance, or, um, you know, your data is being held hostage. And in some circumstances, you might be losing a lot of money a day as a result. And so, um, you know, having, um, protections of privilege and really kind of understanding what to do in making some risk, uh, assessments, um, you know, is very important. And, and we kind of step in and help our clients with that. It really seems like at SciFarf you're able to marry kind of that tech acumen with the legal expertise and kind of think of, you know, doing the legal issue spotting as applied to technical challenges. Do you, do you have any advice for, I mean, I'm someone who studied existential philosophy, not all of us are technologists by training. Do you have any advice for folks that are lawyers looking to future proof their practice and kind of position themselves in the technology space? Um, but maybe you know they don't have the CISP or Security Plus certification yet. Um, any kind of guidance on you know expanding your expertise because it seems like you've done a great job pivoting from really focused on discovery to privacy and now cyber and man, man control. Some really big shifts that are pretty compelling. Yeah, I mean it's an exciting field. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of getting into it, it's just a matter of kind of immersing yourself, um, you know, in the practice and, and trying to gain some experience, honestly. Um, you know, from a privacy standpoint, from my perspective, it's a special breed of person who, you know, loves to kind of get in there and really understand from a pri privacy perspective, the different overlapping uh, regulatory schema that's out there is, um, is pretty complicated, uh, you know, from a... Um, from the state level to the national level to the global scale, um, a lot of overlapping different requirements and, and very complicated. So it kind of takes a special person to want to jump into that. Um, the technology background is helpful there, mm -hmm. um, but it is absolutely you know, not a requirement. Um, um, you know, technology can certainly help kind of categorize and understand data, right? To the extent that you need to kind of classify it from a privacy perspective. Um, on the cyber side, um, you know, it, it's been a long time since I've actually been hands-on technology, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been a passion and a hobby of mine, and I and I cherish that and leverage it in my legal practice. Um, but it really does help. And I mean, I would say that to any attorney that's kind of starting out or anybody who's trying to 
kind of get into that to the e-discovery and cyber side of things that you know, if, if you're uncomfortable with technology, it might be a little bit more difficult for you. Um, and it, just having that natural intuition with respect to uh, technology and being able to talk to um, data security engineers and, uh, you know, IT personnel um, at the same language that they're using uh, really goes a long way. And then be able to take that and kind of translate it to the legal uh, and regulatory risk aspects of it is a uh, is, is really what our clients find uh, very valuable, uh, particularly uh, given that very practical kind of approach. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I, I always joke that my biggest skill is I can speak geek, but it's sort of you are that hub, that translator between brilliant minds in law and brilliant minds in technology who might as well be speaking Greek and Russian to each other because we don't always cross over. That's um, true. So, so Taking a step back, we, we started this conversation talking about the volume, variety, and velocity of data that's out there, the unique challenges of work from home, all of this pivoting and shifting and innovation. Um, in a lot of ways, it's the most dynamic time I've ever seen in law, especially in an industry that doesn't really love change. Uh, what has happened recently and what are you looking forward to in terms of innovation to continue to face this dynamic and changing legal ecosystem? Sure, so, um, I mean, I would say that the, the, the challenge, um, the, the challenge, but also it's very exciting is to be able to take these various pieces of technology. So we mm -hmm. talked about continuous active learning. Uh, we talked about the uh, portable predictive models. Um, we talked about, you know, really getting the value out of the e-discovery process and getting key information to kind of marry the facts up with the law and leveraging it in downstream litigation. Um, the exciting part of it and the challenge all at the same time is really wrapping that all up into a, a legal services delivery package, right? And making sure that it gets used, right? Um, you know, adoption is sometimes difficult. Um, however, uh, the thing that, that I've seen that really, really helps this is that, you know, corporations are looking very, very carefully at this technology as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's another way that the whole industry has matured, you know, starting out, it was very rare that my clients had mature in-house e-discovery programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the years, I'd like to say that, um, you know, our group has, has done its part in terms of helping our clients get to a, a place where they've got mature in-house programs and really have wrapped their arms around the, the problems uh, from the discovery and information governance perspective. And so, you know, corporations are really looking closely at this technology. And frankly, I think that they should make sure that their outside counsel are taking advantage of it, um, making sure that they're leveraging these tools. Um, you know, a lot of times it's very difficult to measure for any kind of individual um, aspect of the technology, the efficiencies that you're gaining out of it. You know, um, hindsight's always 2020, 20, you know, but it's, it's hard when you're at any given point to say, well, use of this technology has saved us X amount of time and X amount of dollars. But I think that over time, as you, as you utilize this technology on a regular basis, including some of the uh, available workflows and technology to leverage the facts downstream, I think that you'll see that uh, there'll be significant amount of savings when you start to compare new and old ways of doing things over you know years of utilizing the the workflows and the technology. And you know, the faster that you can get through cases and the faster that you can get through discovery, the less money you're gonna spend ultimately. Um, you know, so there's a lot of ways to strategically use the technology mm -hmm. to you know, get speed to evidence, get documents out there, get documents produced, um, you know, and, and while complying with the federal rules of civil procedure in such a way that will put you in a very good standing with the court and the opposing counsel in terms of the homework that you've done in the background that you have done to make sure that you've got a, a good set of data and a defensible approach. I mean, I think you're spot on. Clients are smarter and savvier. We've got organizations like Clock. And I, mean, I, I had a large bank that when I was still at Gibson Dunn came to me and applied AI to five years of billing. It was asking why I had a partner on a second request versus a senior associate. It's, um, I, I think it's a really fascinating time. And I, I think you're right that 
the attorneys, the firms, the practices that embrace technology are just going to have such a leg up. It. People always joke like, oh, you know, Terminator is going to replace us. It's not going to be Terminator. It's going to be the Jays of the world that have embraced technology and are able to get evidence more quickly. So I, yeah. I think it's a really exciting time to be a tech forward attorney. Yeah, I'm definitely, definitely an evangelist and uh, get very excited talking about this. And, you know, it's my, it's my hope that, uh, you know, the bug catches um, uh, and I can get other people excited about it. Um, and that, you know, my partners are talking to their clients about it, or they're th at least thinking about it, you know, when they're thinking about handling a portfolio of cases. I mean, the, the level of um, capability that we can bring to the table um, is pretty astounding. You know, it, we've, we at the firm have a tremendous bench in terms of our substantive capabilities. Um, and it's only amplified by the, the approaches, our, you know, our, our innovation and our willingness to kind of dive into the use of this technology and to be able to use it in an effective way, you know, to support our clients on the merits of a particular case, right? There's, there's a lot that can be done in the background to kind of make sure that the, the best parts of the case, you know, shine. Well, I can't imagine a better way to, to wrap this up than to talk about making our clients shine with technology. Um, <laughs> do you have any parting thoughts for our, our illustrious audience? before we go? Um, no, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you, Kat, and I hope that our viewers, um, you know, get something out of it. Um, you know, I, I definitely would be willing to uh, uh, certainly answer any questions that people have out of this. I'm sure there'll be a way for them to, to reach out to us um, as well. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Absolutely, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm volunteering you and me to be the resident data and e-discovery dork because everyone needs a go-to resource. Um, and with that, I, I'd like to thank the audience and thank everyone for coming. And I hope this was an insightful panel for the litigation e-discovery context. Thank you guys. Thank you very much.